Next, it's my pleasure to introduce our um, guest speakers for the first general session today, which is anaphylaxis management in the school setting, best practices for treatment and prevention. The first speaker is Nina Fakaris. And Nina is a school nurse for the Beaverton School District in Beaverton, Oregon. She's responsible for provision of school health programs for approximately 4,200 students and staff. Nina has also served on the board of directors for the National Association of School Nurses since 2009. As a board member of NASN, Nina served on the Food Allergy Advisory Committee. In 2008-2009, Nina was awarded as the Oregon School Nurse of the Year. And in 2009 and 2010, she was awarded National School Nurse of the Year. So we're very honored to have Nina be one of our speakers today. And our second speaker is Dr. Phil Lieberman. Dr. Phil Lieberman is currently Clinical Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics in the Departments of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics, Divisions of Allergy and Immunology at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine in Memphis, Tennessee. He is a graduate of the University of Tennessee College of Medicine and also completed his internal medicine training at this institution. He did his allergy immunology fellowship at Northwestern University. Dr. Phil Lieberman is former president of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology and the American Association of Certified Allergists. He has also served on the board of directors of the American Board of Allergy and Immunology. So let's welcome our two guest speakers. Thank you, Carmen. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this morning. As you can see by our next slide, this will share our um, um, faculty disclosure and our conflict of interest information. Let's look at our learning objectives for today. They are to quickly recognize whether a child is having an anaphylactic reaction based upon established clinical criteria, develop and regularly review an in-school emergency action plan that includes the administration of intramuscular epinephrine for anaphylactic reactions, and to collaborate with a child's health care provider and parent for the planning and prevention of anaphylactic reactions. First of all, I'd like to start today's program by asking you all a question. So if you can respond by a show of hands, have you ever seen a child having an anaphylactic reaction? OK, that's quite a few of us. Dr. Lieberman, let's get your thoughts. What do you feel are some of the barriers to the care of the school-aged child with serious allergies? Thanks, Nina. Uh, before I give you my thoughts, I want to tell you I, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm the uh, father of a child who has experienced uh, probably 20 anaphylactic episodes and the grandfather uh, of uh, two. You can't hear me? Uh, can you hear? How's that? You hear it? <laughs> okay. First of all, I, I, I repeat that I, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, you are a very, very important group, uh, not only to uh, for children with, who suffer anaphylactic episodes, but for me personally. Uh, I happen to be the father of a child who has experienced probably 20 episodes of anaphylaxis, a couple of them life-threatening, uh, and the grandfather now of a uh, eight-year-old and a four-year-old, both of whom had their first episode of anaphylaxis before entering grade school. Uh, and so I've had uh, personal experience in dealing with school nurses, uh, and, and, and you're very key uh, to saving lives in this situation. And as I go through my lecture, uh, I'll, I'll show you why. But uh, in answer to your question, Nina, uh, it's um, children with anaphylaxis are unique. First of all, I, if you think about this, we see them as a doctor. I give them instructions one time. Uh, I give them an injector to keep with them. Uh, the parents aren't there. We try and train the children to use it if they're old enough. But they may not have an opportunity to use that for a year, maybe two years. Now, you think about things that you use in your life uh, 
uh, only occasionally, like every time I go abroad, uh, where's my passport? And God only knows where I put it when I got home last time. So uh, it's very difficult for a child. And also, children are different. If, when an adult experiences this, they don't have any embarrassment usually pulling that kit out and using it. But children, my granddaughter just hates it when she has to do that amongst her peers. And so she delays, she puts it off, she denies. And children are difficult in that regard, teenagers especially. Uh, and then finally, uh, this, again, when they do have it, and it is there, it's hard for them to remember. It's hard for them uh, uh, to, to even know where they put it. So having these injectors present in our school systems and people trained to use them are actually key, very key, uh, to saving lives with children with anaphylaxis. Thank you, Dr. Lieberman. I'm now going to turn the program over to Dr. Lieberman to review some of the key aspects of anaphylaxis. We're going to first talk about, can you hear me? I think, am I, am I projecting? Good. Uh, the epidemiology of anaphylaxis. And uh, first of all, one of the things that we know for sure uh, is that it, it, it occurs more frequently than we ever thought. In Canada, for example, uh, one to two percent of people in Manitoba, Canada are given uh, an automatic epinephrine injector prescription. Since there's only one indication for that, we can assume that one to two percent of the population is at risk. We recently did a poll called Anaphylaxis in America, and we got the same figure. Two percent of people in America have experienced an anaphylactic episode, according to this poll, which was done nationwide. Hospitalization and fatality rates uh, are very important health problems, and the most common allergens that uh, cause anaphylaxis are foods and then stinging insects in children. Uh, it's more common in children and adolescents. Food allergy in children occurs in 8% of the population, and 20% of the population of the United States of America is allergic. Uh, so it, and it's increasing very rapidly. We're in an epidemic of anaphylaxis and an epidemic of allergy. Uh, there are eight major foods that account for over 90% of the reactions, and they're shown on this slide. And food is the most common cause of anaphylaxis in the outpatient setting, and food allergens account for about a third of fatal cases of anaphylaxis, and the vast majority of anaphylaxis in children. This is a very important slide. I told you that you're very important people in this, in this issue, and indeed you are. If you will look here, the first episode of anaphylaxis is quite common in a home. And then the second, third, et cetera, can occur anywhere. And if you look at the blue, that's how many episodes percent-wise that occur in schools. From 2001 to 2005, there were over a million total emergency department visits, 203,000 for food-related acute allergic reactions, 448,000 visits, 90,000 per year classified as probable food anaphylaxis. And so one visit every three minutes for anaphylaxis, one visit every six minutes uh, for food-related events. And this is the increasing pattern of anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is the most rapid curve there. That's the yellow one with the circles. And that's true not only in the United States, but in every developed country in the world. Uh, it is the most rapidly increasing disease uh, in worldwide that we have at the present time. There are a lot of unmet uh, needs in schools. Uh, school nurses and staff are, are, are very concerned, we know that, about not having enough information and, and enough information on treatment. 48 percent, in one study, only 16 percent of students in 109 schools had emergency action plans. 48% of children do not carry their prescribed auto injectors in school. 78% had their device in the nurse's office, and only 19% of those were staffed by a full-time nurse. Up to, this is really important. Uh, I just came back from Geneva, and I found there were three reports on this from three different countries. The data are all the same. 
25% of the reactions that occur in a school, at least, are the first episode. So that a patient, a child, has never had an episode before, uh, and, and, and they'll have an episode in the school setting. And that's why it's so important for people to be aware of how to handle this and to be able to diagnose it when it does occur. And although some states permit epinephrine uh, stocking, many more do not allow for a non-prescribed epinephrine injector to be available. This is what we don't want to happen. And it is happening, and it's happening in increased frequency. It's a death in a school. Uh, this is from the Chicago Tribune. Uh, this child was the child of physicians, uh, and uh, they had a party in school. Uh, they uh, ordered out Chinese food. Uh, they, the the, the uh, teacher was very aware of this child's condition. They asked if there was any peanut in the food. They were told no. Uh, there was peanut in the food, uh, and the child died. The auto-injector was not close enough. It wasn't available. There were three deaths in Georgia, I believe, over the last uh, three years uh, in the school systems. Uh, and the number are increasing. And this is why we need people like you available and why we need trained people to administer uh, the epinephrine auto-injectors. Uh, now, this caused a legislative call to action. Uh, and Chicago now uh, has, has taken steps uh, to have these injectors available. And this is what we want nationwide. And is it anaphylaxis? When does it occur? Uh, anaphylaxis is a serious systemic allergic reaction. From the show of your hands, I don't really have to tell you that because you've seen it yourself. Quick recognition is critical. We know that the major cause of death is delay in treatment or the wrong treatment. There is only one drug to treat anaphylaxis. It's epinephrine. There is no other drug. I'm going to show you why later. Anaphylaxis is, de is, de is defined by a two-system involvement, uh, and it doesn't require shock. People don't have to go into shock. In fact, in kids, the major source of death is not anaphylactic shock. Very rarely does it occur. It's respiratory death. Uh, kids with asthma die very frequently. And if it's not asthma, it's obstruction of the upper airway. So shock doesn't occur very often in children. And reactions have multiple mediators. Uh, therefore, a single drug acting to uh, block one mediator is just simply not going to be effective. And we'll show you the information on that. This is a little hard to wrap your mind around quickly. Uh, and and I've, I was part of the committee who uh, defined anaphylaxis by these criteria. I'm going to ask you to take a look at this, because to go over it with you, it won't stick in your mind this morning. But basically, it requires two systems. And it depends on whether or not you're dealing with an, a, a known allergen, which only one system is required, a likely allergen uh, which, in which two systems is, is required. And I won't read this to you, but you have it, and you'll take a look at it. Now, Nina. Uh, you're in a school ses uh, setting. What criteria do you use to determine whether someone is having an anaphylactic reaction? And at what point do you determine whether it's life-threatening? Well, we try to follow the criteria that you folks have seen on the other slide. Um, I don't have access to blood pressure equipment at all of my schools, so it's hard for me to measure that. So what we really rely on is just just observation skills, um, assessing the child when they first come in. What's their skin color? Um, are they having hives? Are they rubbing their throat because their throat feels itchy? Um, the other thing we look at is their mental status. Are you able to distract them with conversation enough that they're able to kind of get their mind off of it? Or, or are they so hyper-focused on, on what's happening to them clinically that, that they're not able, you're not able to draw them away from that? And then obviously we look for any increase in those symptoms. Are they, are they becoming pale? Are they becoming more flushed? Are we starting to see a change in their level of consciousness and responsiveness 
to our verbal directions and verbal commands? Are we beginning to hear the wheezing, see the gulping for breath? Any of those changes, then, we would consider life-threatening and call for quick action. <clears throat> we have prepared a video case study that addresses some of the issues we can encounter in the school setting. So let's meet Katie and her mom. Hi, my name is Allison and this is my daughter Katie. Katie is seven years old and she's in second grade. My husband and I have always been aware of how dangerous allergies can be in children. So we've been careful about what we give Katie to eat. We wouldn't even let her have strawberries until she was five years old. And we did our best to follow the recommendations that we found on the internet for avoiding eggs, milk, peanuts, and fish. But just recently, we found out that Katie is allergic to peanuts. We've never given Katie plain peanuts, but we've never really monitored the ingredients in the processed foods she eats. About three months ago, Katie ate something that caused a reaction. It was a chocolate chip cookie. It was a packaged cookie we got at the store. After she ate it, she got some hives on her chest and neck and had trouble breathing. And it made my throat hurt a little. We gave Katie her inhaler because she also has intermittent asthma. And at the time, we didn't really think anything of it. The cookie wrapper said it was processed in a facility with peanuts, tree nuts, and soy, but everything we read about food allergies described severe reactions. This seemed really mild, sort of like when she gets a skin rash after rolling in the grass. So we just gave her an antihistamine. We didn't take her to the doctor or bother alerting Katie's school about her reaction with the cookie. Dr. Lieberman, what are your thoughts when you hear a story like this? Well, my first thought is this is exactly what I see in practice every, every day, and uh, it's very typical. And my second thought is I think if there's one learning point from this um, is that a mild reaction doesn't mean the next reaction is going to be mild. And a mild reaction to start with doesn't mean it's going to stay mild. So that in the largest series of anaphylactic deaths uh, that we have, patients were not treated because it started out mild and they died. And in addition, and a good percent of those patients had a mild reaction preceding a severe reaction. It was so mild that the physician seeing the patient on the first reaction didn't prescribe an automatic epinephrine injector. And as this progresses, I think you'll get a taste for this as the talks go on. Okay, let's move on and take a look at Katie's history. So as the school nurse, this is the information that you would have about her in your health office. She's a healthy seven-year-old girl. Height, weight, vitals are all within normal limits. Physical exams are up to date. She does have the diagnosis of mild intermittent asthma. Current medications include over-the-counter antihistamines and a short-acting beta-2 antagonist inhaler, which we don't have at school because her asthma is so mild. Immunizations are up to date, and she's had minimal contact with the health room. So as the provider in the school setting, we really have no knowledge of the risk of anaphylaxis to Katie. So let's see what happens next. As I said before, aside from the really mild reaction Katie had after she ate the cookie, she's never shown any signs of a food allergy. However, earlier this week, Katie had another reaction while at school. This one was much more severe. My friend gave me a granola bar at lunch. About five minutes after she ate it, her teacher said Katie started to get hives on her chest and neck, and her face was swollen around her eyes. I couldn't breathe, and then I got dizzy. They took her to the nurse's office and called me right away. They said the reaction was getting worse, so I rushed out of work to get to her school, which is about 15 minutes away. I was incredibly nervous and worried about Katie. I've read about bad allergic reactions before, but it still doesn't prepare you for when it happens to your child. Now, Dr. Lieberman's going to talk in a minute about what to do in an emergency situation, but what I'd like you to be thinking about right now is what would you have done? What would your reaction have been to Katie if you'd have been the nurse in the health room, knowing that we have no history of or knowledge of possible anaphylaxis? 
how is your school and staff prepared to handle an emergency situation like this if you're not there? And then in follow-up, how would you follow up with your school staff and Katie and Katie's parents? So you can see from these two videos uh, that a situation can go from good to life-threatening uh, very quickly. And this is my favorite part of the lecture because what I'm going to do now is sort of what I call bringing the bench to the bedside. I'm going to really show you the science about why I have mentioned to you the things that I talked about earlier, where we extract our data uh, to set our policies for treatment. Uh, and uh, now you'll, tell, you'll see why uh, I mentioned the things that I mentioned. Here are the factors uh, that we consider important uh, in a drug for an anaphylactic event. Uh, there can be a rapid progression of an event. There are many mediators responsible, not just one. Uh, the uh, onset of action of the drug has to be very quickly, and the method of administration of therapy has to allow for a rapid onset of action. So the factors that increase the risk of an event and its, and its severity are previous history of an anaphylactic event, even a mild one, especially asthma in children. Children with asthma uh, are the ones that die the most frequently. And adolescents and young adults are risk takers. Uh, they, they just simply have a sense of immortality. If you've ever raised a teenager, uh, you know that. Uh, they don't have any concept uh, that they're, that they're uh, so vulnerable. And so they don't carry their uh, epinephrine injectors with them, and often they don't use them uh, when they do carry them. Delays in administration can be fatal. Uh, they can, uh, episodes can progress rapidly. A failure to administer epinephrine promptly, we've told you, is a leading risk factor uh, for death. Uh, and uh, the vasopressor effect of epinephrine, along with its effects uh, in preventing and relieving uh, laryngeal edema, as well as bronchoconstriction in children, are the most important pharmacologic activities. This is a very important slide, and it's one that I, if you don't take anything else home, take this home. If I give a shot in my office and a patient has an anaphylactic event, the median time from the onset of symptoms to death is five minutes. If a patient receives a sting and they have an anaphylactic event in the field, the median time to death is 15 minutes. And with food, the median time to death is 30 minutes. So if you give a drug that has an onset of action that isn't immediate, it's already too late. Uh, and 50% of deaths uh, in one of the largest series occurred within 60 minutes of the onset of symptoms. Anaphylaxis is not mediated by histamine alone, and therefore antihistamines antagonize only one of the mediators. Uh, it won't work on the other mediators, so it's not a good drug to treat. Uh, clinical practice parameters state that antihistamines should never be used alone in the treatment of anaphylaxis. They can be given, but only after epinephrine is administered. And in fact, uh, my own personal practice was usually to give uh, an automatic injector plus an antihistamine the patient keeps with them. I stopped doing that because, I, because what patients did is they, they just took the antihistamine. They just didn't want to take the injector. So I had to change the way I practice. This is how long histamine, antihistamines take to work. If you give it intramuscular, this is intramuscular diphenhydramine, uh, it's uh, only 50% effective uh, at about uh, uh, close to an hour. So I just showed you that death occurs before that. So it's just not going to work. Uh, in addition, epinephrine antagonizes all of the effects of anaphylaxis, all of the pharmaco pharmacologic effects. The, the alpha adrenergic activity constricts blood vessels. The uh, beta adrenergic activity increases heart uh, contraction and dilates the lungs so that it acts on all the activities, whereas antihistamines really only act on one, uh, and that's the blood vessels. 
And this is the time of onset of the action of epinephrine. As you can see, it occurs within 10 minutes to raise the blood pressure and about the same time to relax the bronchial tubes. Uh, automatic epinephrine injectors come in two doses, a child's dose uh, that is uh, up to uh, 30 uh, kilograms uh, and a, a dose for one weighing over 30 kilograms, uh, which is uh, an adult dose usually. And it's 0.15 to 0.3 cc's uh, is the dose. And then uh, the frequency of administration can be every five to 10 minutes. So what we tell our patients is, you take the first injection immediately. If you are not improved in five to 10 minutes, you take the second injection. And in patients who are, are well divorced from uh, emergency facilities, uh, like patients who go uh, camping, uh, we'll give them four injectors so uh, they'll have a longer access. Most people will be able to reach an emergency facility uh, with two but it's nice to have four available if it takes longer, if you're in a rural uh, school setting, for example. Two doses are imperative. Uh, one dose simply isn't sufficient. Up to 33% of people who have an anaphylactic event will require two doses. Uh, biphasic events can occur where a patient gets well and then the symptoms return. Uh, two doses are necessary. The, sub the episode may be severe and two doses are, are, are necessary. And once again, you can give the second dose within five minutes if there's no improvement. And there's absolutely no way to predict who will need one and who will need two. The practice parameters that we wrote state that IM epinephrine should be administered at an appropriate dose without delay at the onset of symptoms immediately. I am epinephrine is the most important treatment. Next is patient position. If they're breathing okay, they should be paced in a Trendelenburg uh, position with legs elevated flat. If they can't breathe, we allow them to sit up. Oxygen is next, then IV fluids and all the other things. Antihistamines, corticosteroids are way down the list. They're not life-saving. They're only good, they kick in late. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Nina. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lieberman. Now that we've spent some time discussing how to recognize and treat anaphylaxis, we'd like to discuss how we can identify risk factors and plan for future reactions. So, audience, by a show of hands again, does your school have an emergency action plan in place and that, so that you're able to respond to allergic events? How many have emergency action plans? Remembering that's the school-wide plan on how to deal with anaphylactic events. Now, how many of you have student-specific emergency care plans in place for students identified with anaphylaxis? That's fantastic. What we really need to do is to be able to identify the students' risks, factors at school, and the school environment and assess what that is. So we can get some of this information from our parent history when we visit with our parents. What we really need to understand is that you are the medical expert in the school building and you are the only one that understands what can medically happen to the student and how to plan for that in your school and assess that environment. So first of all, we need to know has the, has the allergen been confirmed? Is, has the student actually experienced an episode of anaphylaxis? Or has it just been diagnosed because of, with blood testing? Um, has the student had a reaction to trace exposures in the past? An important thing to understand how quickly their body responds to exposures and trace amounts. And likewise, does the student have asthma or another atopic disease? Dr. Lieberman alluded to how important that is and how dangerous that can be for our kids. We also need to look at the student's environment, <clears throat> the actual physical layout of your school building. Um, are they gonna be going to a shop class or a ceramics class? Um, what is the playground like? What is the cafeteria like? One of my experiences last year, I have 
a school, an elementary school, that has about 22 children with peanut allergies. And so the, so the entire staff is trained, and the entire staff know about these kids. The custodian was coming in one Monday morning. They use our, our playground field for rec soccer on the weekends. And in the covered playground area, he saw there was an entire section of, of peanut shells. Obviously, that had been the halftime snack at the soccer game. Understanding the importance of that information, he called me so that we were able to take care of the kids and isolate them and clean everything and do all the preventative things that we had to do. But it's important because you are the ones that are sharing with that, that information with your staff so they know how to prepare. Does your student have a student-specific emergency care plan? And does your school have an emergency action plan? Probably the most key information is where's the nearest dose of epinephrine? Where is that dose for that student? Is it a high school student who's supposed to be carrying it in their backpack? Is it locked up in the health room? I have a student at my high school who we determined this year he was going to keep his epinephrine in his car, in the glove box in his car. Not the best, but he plays basketball after the school hours. The health room is locked. We have no access to get to his epinephrine in the school office. So he's supposed to keep one in his gym bag, but his backup is in his glove box. Where is that nearest dose? Some of the key considerations that we need to look at <clears throat> are, what is your school environment? What does your emergency action plan need to look like? Are you a building with portables? Do you have modulars? Do you have stairs? How far is your gym from your health room? How far is your cafeteria? What classroom, and where's the classroom location for your students with anaphylaxis? How often do you review your emergency action plan for your entire building and your emergency care plan for your specific students? And what education do you provide to your students and your staff? How much time will the principal give you at a staff meeting to introduce anaphylaxis to your school staff? <clears throat> we have given you some tools. You will find them at the table <clears throat> for you. What I'd like to do now is just quickly review the NASA's um, anaphylaxis planning algorithm. This is the algorithm that allows you to begin to develop these kinds of plans. When a student is first enrolled in your school, hopefully you will be notified if the parents indicate that there's some form of an allergy or possible anaphylaxis. And then you follow the algorithm through development, speaking with the medical pro provider, um, ascertaining emergency medications, developing your emergency care plans for your student, <clears throat> looking at what their previous experiences have been. The next algorithm that we've given you is the provision of care and post-exposure phases. So the provision of care looks at, it gives you the tools that you could use in developing an emergency action plan for your school and an emergency specific, student specific emergency care plan for your students. Gives you some of those tools. And then likewise, the next one is if the student is actually exposed to an allergen. Do they have a reaction? If not, you still need the plan. The plan still needs to be in place and you need to reiterate that and emphasize that with your school staff. If a reaction did take place, was the emergency care plan followed? Did the staff understand it? Was everybody notified? Was the, did the student receive the appropriate emergency care? And then after an event, reevaluate. Reevaluate your plan. Talk to the staff. Debrief the staff. And reiterate and retrain. Dr. Lieberman, as we've talked about these plans, what do you see are the pitfalls when you're involved in treating someone with anaphylaxis in an emergency? You know, I, I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, as allergists, we give allergy injections in our office, and uh, we see cases of anaphylaxis not infrequently. Uh, 
and it, it's scary, uh, it, especially scary um, for, for you. I'm in an office, we're equipped with everything. We've got defibrillators and IVs, and uh, so we can uh, give pretty good tertiary care. Uh, and and I, I'm still uh, nervous when it happens. I, I, it's probably the worst 15 minutes of my life. Uh, I have a son, I told you, who was, uh, had, had anaphylaxis, and uh, he um, had an episode while he was out of town. And uh, that was his first episode, uh, and he was at school. And he called me and he told me, I'm feeling funny. I, I'm itching all over and I'm getting dizzy and I can't breathe, he's an asthmatic. I knew immediately uh, what that was. And fortunately, he had a friend and I said, let me talk to your friend. Uh, what's the nearest emergency room? Stop everything now, take him to that emergency room. Uh, and uh, I called the emergency room. It so happened the resident, um, the doctor, emergency doctor on call, was a former resident of mine. Uh, I trained him and he said, Dr. Lieberman, uh, you trained me very well in the treatment of anaphylaxis. I, I know how to take care of it, don't worry. I'll meet your son in the parking lot. And he did indeed with an automatic epinephrine injector. Uh, and, and, and before he got out of the car, uh, my child had received it, and he did quite well. Even that type of experience, however, uh, when my grandchildren and I was visiting them, uh, they had both grandchildren had an episode of anaphylaxis when I happened to be visiting them for the weekend. Uh, and, uh, and, and no matter you know, how many times I do it, it it's still scary. So the things you have to do is to fight that fear is give the shot immediately, observe the patient, make sure you have a second dose available. Do not hesitate. You can't hurt a kid with epinephrine. You just can't do it. Uh, uh, and, and the dose that we give, remember, the dose you're giving now is really half the dose that I used to give when I started practice. Uh, we used to give 0.5 cc's to kids. Now, uh, the reason it's changed is because that's the dose we have in this automatic epinephrine injector. And that, I won't go through the history of how that happened, but now we do 0.3. But you're not gonna hurt that child by giving a second dose if they're not better in five minutes. And then make sure that they're, when they go to the uh, medical facility that they're going to afterwards, make sure you call 911 and then that they're observed because we recommend an observation period of at least six hours. Thanks, Diane. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we learn from the fatal cases of anaphylaxis that's occurred in the school setting. Fatal cases of anaphylaxis is one of those never events. It should never occur in the school setting. And it's important, I think, for us to just keep in mind the gravity of this disease and our treatment. There's another great tool that we've provided for you in your packet. It's, it's the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network um, Food Allergy Action Plan. It's FAN's plan. It will really help you in looking at and evaluating the current emergency care plans that you develop. And if you don't have any great tools, it's a good one to begin with. It does give you some great information. I do have one more question for the audience, though. <clears throat> do you teach your students how to self-administer their auto-injector? How many have the time and the ability to be able to do that? Okay, not nearly as many of us have the time to actually teach our students how to administer their auto-injector. Dr. Lieberman, why is this so important? It's incredibly important. Uh, and. Uh, we know that people who have these injectors uh, don't use them, uh, even though they, they have been trained. Uh, and they have to be trained and get the device that they're prescribed. At one time, we had some generic uh, uh, automatic in injectors available. And if you train them on one and they're given a generic, they won't know how to use it when they open it up. 
So they need to be trained on a device and have that device available to them. They, they, they don't carry it. I have to tell you, my son, when he got older, we took a vacation to St. Thomas, and he had his, his uh, girl du jour uh, with him. <laughs> uh, and we went to a restaurant in St. Thomas. Now, I don't know where the emergency rooms are in St. Thomas. Uh, and he had in the restaurant, he ate, I, it, it, we, you know, we avoid that, the things that he's allergic to, but he ate something that was contaminated with this food. I never know what it was. He didn't have an injector with him. He didn't have it. He knew how to use it, but he didn't have it. So it, death by hand of father, was he was at risk of, but <laughs> he survived that episode. Uh, and when I went back and asked him, uh, why, why didn't you keep this injector with you, damn it? Uh, he, he said, well, Dad, I was wearing jeans. So what does that have to do with it? I, I don't want a lump in my jeans. I said, when you're my age, a lump in your jeans is a good thing. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I told you that anecdote. It's a true story, by the way. But uh, we, 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 we finished in time, so I, I wanted to share with you. But the important thing is that y y these people are trained only once in my office. And it's, you, guys, I don't, you guys just you ladies don't know how important you are. You, you are really key. Uh, and, and you need to be able uh, and, and, and to use these, and you need to have time to train these patients. So thanks, Nina. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that I make sure that I do when students bring in um, their emergency medication, oftentimes, if they get the nice um, dual pack of um, epinephrine, um, the trainer is also in the box. And one of the things that we make sure to do is to go in and pull the trainers out of the box. Because I've had too many cases and instances of friends, luckily not at school, saying that they accidentally grabbed the trainer and administered the trainer, and gee, you know, it didn't work very well. So, so I think that's just another thing that's important. And it's important lessons for us to teach our children and our students to be aware of exactly what it is that they're having. And honestly, student education can be very quick. Five minutes, let me grab you in between passing time of classes, show me where you keep your epinephrine, and let me show you how to use it. Now, before we wrap up, what we'd like to do is look at just some of the universal recommendations for students and patients that are at risk for anaphylaxis. And this is based on clinical guidelines. Every student should have epinephrine auto-injector prescriptions at least two doses. They should have auto-injector training. They should have education on the avoidance of the allergen. Your school should have an emergency action plan, and your students should have a student-specific emergency care plan. We should recommend that they follow up with their primary care clinician, but we should also advocate for students who have reactions to unknown causes that they see an allergist, see a specialist. What does the future hold for us? Well, one of the top legislative priorities for NASN is Senate Bill 1884, which is the universal stocking of unspecified epinephrine in the schools. If you would like more information on that, go to the NASN website, Click on the Advocacy tab and you will see the legislation. You'll see the actual bill wording. You'll get to see what senators and House of Representatives have signed on to that bill. If you have any questions regarding that legislation, please see one of the NASA officers or your board of directors and we'll be happy to explain that. One of the other things that we can help advocate for is the requirement that all EMS response units carry epinephrine. Even though they can legally, many of them don't. And we're pleased to say that in May of this year, all ambulances in New York State will be required to carry epinephrine. 
So one of the planning things, tools you need to do is you're looking at your school environment. Check with your emergency medical response units. Do they carry epinephrine? Check with your ambulance companies that respond. Do they carry auto-injector epinephrine? If not, you can advocate for it, but you can also mention to some of your parents of students with anaphylaxis and have them advocate for that. It's a false sense of security when we call 911 and we're just waiting to give that epi, and we call 911 thinking that they'll do that when they might not even have that medication available. So we have the summary coming up soon. So what I'd like to do, we do have some time for questions. So if you have questions, there are microphones, I believe, in the level with the, um, with the camera. So please come on up. So as we summarize, what I'd like to say, what is vital, is that we have quick recognition of anaphylaxis. That's key to treatment. And Dr. Lieberman has just explained to us why and how important that is. We must implement the child's emergency care plan. IM epinephrine is the preferred and really only treatment of choice for acute management. Students at risk for anaphylaxis should carry more than one auto-injector. We need to confirm that the students know how to use their auto-injector properly. And we need to provide education on allergen avoidance and have emergency action plans for our schools and care plans for our students. This last slide shows you some of the additional resources that you have in developing your anaphylaxis program. FAN, the Food Allergy Network and Anaphylaxis Network, has some amazing information on their website. Um, Kids with Food Allergies and Allergy Kids Foundation have some excellent educational information. The NASN Toolkit is also available on the website. It will help walk you through how to develop a school plan, gives you excellent forms, the history, anaphylaxic history, care plan ideas. But most of all, we need you to be the advocate for our students, because you need to help us ensure that their environment is fully equipped to deal with an anaphylactic emergency. So thank you, and let's start taking some questions. <laughs>